Happy New Year, everyone. I hope you had uh, wonderful holidays and uh, that the beginning of the year is treating you very well. So there's been a recurring theme over the last few months where people keep asking me, how is it that you seem to have this super passionate life where you can do all these different types of activities and play with your son and frankly live life to the fullest and yet be extraordinarily productive uh, when it comes to work and get so, so much done. And I decided that it warranted uh, sharing all my tips and secrets with all of you. And you know, to illustrate that, perhaps probably worth uh, showing an example of what I do in a given year uh, for a brief moment. So let me show you this. So this is my uh, year-end review, where I review everything that I did personally and professionally uh, throughout the year, uh, from adventures, playing with Fafa, to going to different locations, and also review what happened, the speeches I gave, what we accomplished at work, uh, and my predictions for the year. So this is my blog. It's called uh, 2023, An Angel is Born, as a uh, homage to my new dog, uh, Angel, which you can see there. But how to do all this, how to lead this passionate life is uh, something I want to share with, with all of you. So without any further ado, let's get going. Welcome to episode 44, Unlocking Productivity, Streamlining Your Days for Passion and Purpose. Now, the main reason to do this, by the way, is not to improve productivity, right? Like you're not being productive for the sake of being productive. You're being productive for the sake of uh, living your best possible life. So obviously, to some extent, it starts with understanding what is it that you love to do? What is it that you are extraordinarily good at and focus on that? And everything else, you know, don't focus. But generally speaking, there are three types of tricks or tips for productivity. So I'm going to separate this presentation in three parts. One is general tricks and tips. Two, how to outsource all the things you can do online and you can outsource more than you think. And then three, all the things you could outsource offline. And along the way, we'll discuss some of the life setup choices that I've made, which again, these are more personal choices, uh, but it goes to show you can lead non-traditional lives that are still amazingly effective. Um, so let me start with the uh, Sharing my screen. Up. One second. Let's reset it up. Okay, perfect. Uh, the presentation is ready to go. So I'll start with the general productivity tips. I'll spend a fair amount of time here because some of these things seem easy to describe, but I think we're fundamental. So the first thing is spend extraordinarily little time following news. Uh, writ large. And I by news, I mean everything, you know, newspapers, radio news, TV news, uh, you name it. I don't actually even follow politics. So I actually take this to an ultimate extreme. I don't follow news at all. And I'll talk about why that is, how you stay informed when you're not following news, and, and, what, and how do you allocate your time otherwise. So the first thing you need to remember is uh, news is... Uh, n the news is not actually meant to inform you. It is created by media companies. These media companies are trying to capture your attention and they're trying to capture your attention in order to sell you advertising or to sell advertising. And the best way to do that is to focus on negative information because your amygdala is um, hypersensitive to, to negative information. So the way your brain works is obviously 10 to up to 10,000 years ago, if you saw a ruffling in the leaves or whatever, it could be a tiger and it could eat you. And if you were not focused on the negative news, you would actually not be able to survive. You would be eaten by the tiger. And as a result, humans are hypersensitive to negative information. And media companies have realized that and they're focusing on outrage and they're focusing on all the things that can uh, annoy you to capture your attention. But it's actually extraordinarily terrible for your mind. And when you look at it on a day-by-day -day basis, if you follow the news, uh, it feels to me that the news has this eye of Modor, where they focus on one thing, whatever is capturing the current zeitgeist, whether it's COVID, uh, whether it's Ukraine or more recently Gaza, 
and it's trying to provoke outrage. Regardless of your point of view, the media outlet you follow is going to uh, try to create outrage for you to keep track, keep your information, or keep your attention and sell you advertising. The issue with that, beyond the fact that it's a massive waste of time and it's negative for you, um, the not much really happens. So, you know, if you take a step back, if you read the newspaper every day or follow the news every day, how much marginal incremental news is there on a daily basis? And you realize it's highly repetitive. And um, at the same time, in addition to being highly repetitive, it often is um, highly sensationalistic. It's not where the actual information is. You know, when the Wright brothers flew a plane for the first time, it actually wasn't reported in the news. It was reported uh, the... The only thing that was reported were like whatever the train accidents and murders and whatever of the day. And these types of break breakthroughs are happening every day and they're not really covered. So when I think about like what I want to be informed on, you know, it's actually not the day to day coverage. So imagine what happened in COVID. When COVID first happened, it was like scares. Oh, we're all going to die. And where people were following uh, who got COVID and who was violating the strict restriction, et cetera. It was like entertainment. It's not news per se. What you really want to know, um, which of course is a book that has not been written yet, is what would have been the policies that would have uh, decreased mental health and physical health outcomes or like led to the best ones without impacting the economy? And maybe the answer changes over time before and after vaccines. But that is not what was covered. It was all like sensationalist bullshit that's not that interesting. Likewise, okay, once you have the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, you know, the play by play minute by minute is not all that relevant. What matters more is like, okay, what are the consequences for Europe, for the US, for the Cold War II setup that we have? And these things are better to look at with like six month or 12 month, the minute by minute outrage, not all that relevant. And so I actually consume zero news. Don't read newspapers, don't watch TV news, etc. The way I stay informed is I partake in a few groups. Um, Ergo, E-R-G-O is one of them. Green Mantle by Neil Ferguson is another. Where every few months, at least once a year, we meet with like policymakers and people that are analysts to think through, okay, what are the conclusions of all these things that have been happening? Um, the one exception to that, which is why I say spend 10 minutes per day on, um, on news, is in my case... Tech news, I actually, it impacts my life uh, and it's important to know what are the trends, who's raising, who's failing. Um, and so I actually do spend 10 minutes a day reading tech meme, sometimes, you know, CNET, Tom's Hardware, these were more entertainment, like these were the gadgets I like or, or Engadget and then TechCrunch and things like that. But I spent the minimum amounts of time news writ large. Instead, I focus on analysts, reports, with the direct primary sources and with six month or a year of like uh, uh, of outlook in terms of like, okay, this is what happened in the last year. And this is what we think probabilistically could happen in a go forward basis. This guy can impact you. This is how I stay on top of like my macro predictions, for instance. It doesn't, you know, it comes from following what's happening at FOMAC, et cetera, not by reading newspapers in any way, shape or form, which all of which are negative. And this applies to news writ large. So, you know, don't follow Twitter, for instance. I think it's also very bad for your uh, uh, mental health and internal health. Uh, number two, um, compartmentalize, meaning be present in whatever it is you're doing. People are terrible at multitasking. Uh, you want to be monotasking and doing one thing and being present in whatever task you're doing. Now, sometimes it's easier to say than to do. But once you're done with work, you know, when you're playing tennis, play tennis. Focus on the next point. Not thinking about like, oh, what you didn't do, what you need to do tomorrow. Otherwise, you're going to be terrible at tennis. <laughs> and it's going to be way harder for you to fall asleep. So be present, you know, leave things in, in one activity for that activity and go back to it when the time comes, but don't deal with it while you're doing something else. Number three is people have a tendency to procrastinate. And um, it's very easy to put off things. And so to get things done, actually set deadlines with short time fuses um, I put it as a deliverable for myself in, in my calendar, and I'll sh talk about how I manage calendar on uh, soon in order to get things done. You know, if I want to write a blog post, I'll actually block time in my calendar for writing the blog post and make sure that it, that, it, that, it's, uh, that it's delivered on time. This way I can publish it on time. B, 
because we live in a world where we're constantly bombarded with information, it's actually good to take time off, right? Like if you are doing, you are not thinking. And so it is good to have time to be reflective. I try to have Fridays where I have much fewer meetings than other days or ideally no meetings that doesn't always plan out that way. And I try not to work weekends these days. Um, but actually having time to think and reflect is very important. In fact, my entire life is structured around, okay, when I'm in New York for like a one month or two months stint, it's all on all the time, be, be it intellectual salons, dinners, et cetera. And then when I go to Turks and Caicos, because in the evenings, there's nothing social for me to do there. That's when I'm more reflective. I read, I write, I publish many more blog posts. I, and I'm trying to be more thoughtful. Um, next point is limit meetings. I think that's a generally accepted rule, but meetings need to have a purpose. Like if you're taking a meeting, you need to know what, why you're meeting, who you're meeting with, what you're trying to get out of it. So it needs to be a clear agenda. It should have as few people as possible in the meeting. And I try to keep them to 30 minutes or less. Now I've realized that when I'm evaluating a startup, 30 minutes is usually too short. So it's more an hour that I block just to be safe and make sure I have the time to go in enough depth to make a proper investment decision. Um, but in general, the keep, me, keep meetings short and, and try to get to the point of them. And as a rule, what, I'm do, what I do is my meetings are back to back in 30 minute increments. So in a given day, I could have 14 meetings. Um, if someone shows up 15 minutes late, they only get 15 minutes. If they show up 31 minutes late, they get no minutes. Uh, I'm not, I'm going to be on time for every one of the meetings. I think punctuality is a mark of respect and you want to be on time. Uh, and in fact, the number one complaint many founders have of VCs is they don't respect their times when they're late. So show up actually one or two minutes early to every meeting and respect and, and respect the time of the other. And so if you show up 31 minutes late, you are going to be rescheduled for a future date and maybe never rescheduled depending on how I feel and why it happened. Uh, next point is make very quick decisions, right? It's better to make a quick decision and be wrong because you can course correct than to look for perfection. It's definitely true in, in business settings uh, in, and in startups where you'd rather make a decision, <laughs> throw the spaghetti on the wall, see if the spaghetti is, is uh, sticking and if not, you know, uh, move on and try something else. Time blocking. So what I do, and I, I will demonstrate that shortly with an example day in my calendar, is everything is in my calendar. So if I need to do emails, it's in the calendar. If I need, uh, if I'm going to go to the gym, and in fact, if it's there, it gets done. If it's not in the calendar, it does not exist. Uh, next point is more tactical. You want to be focused and present in whatever activity you you are doing. Um, and so all notifications should be off. So my phone does not ring, does not vibrate, doesn't have anything showing up on the screen ever. It's on permanent do not disturb. <laughs> the You cannot get through to me from that perspective. So if I want to go check messages, I will proactively at a time that I choose go to check my Instagram or my WhatsApp or my, or, 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 or my text messages. But even vibration, which feels perhaps is unintrusive. If the phone is in your pocket and it vibrates, it takes your attention away from what you're doing. And all of a sudden you have, you know, FOMO. It's like, ooh, what is it that I'm receiving? What is it I should be checking? So you should not be getting any pop-ups, notifications on anything. Uh, e e new emails coming in should not be bumping, beeping. Nothing should beep. Nothing should vibrate. Nothing should, <laughs> should show up in any way, shape, or form. Now, if you have kids and you're worried that they, you need to be reached by the school or whatever, you can create a role where even though you're in do not disturb, two, three, or four people wouldn't create a very big list, otherwise uh, it defeats the purpose of this, can get through to you. Um, and and I do have that uh, in my case, given that Fafa is going to school. But in general, you don't want any distractions whatsoever. Again, as I mentioned earlier, humans suck at multitasking. You want to be monotasking. If I block an hour for emails, I'm doing emails then. I don't want to be doing anything else. If I'm on a call, I want to be present and focused on that call and taking notes and thinking, not being doing other things. Otherwise, you're not going to have the, the most thoughtful analysis and presence for whatever it is you're doing. Uh, next point is, is uh, general life advice, you know, and uh, basically you want to be in life penny foolish and pound wise. So you want to be extraordinarily careful on large decisions, on large purchases, things that are going to impact you financially. So buying a house, uh, renting something that perhaps is too expensive for you, buying a car, 
um, and definitely avoid luxury items. They're pointless. You know, I don't, I don't have a, I don't have a watch. Um, I have a smartwatch, but I don't have like any luxury items like art, etc. They don't bring me pleasure. They're not really useful. I'd rather splurge on experiences uh, when travel with like friends and family rather than than physical goods in general, which probably makes a lot of sense. Um, and last but not least, you know, you need probably way fewer items than you think you do. And um, that means it is very healthy to at least once a year do a, uh, a, a, a pruning. I just give away things I don't use. So every spring I do a spring cleaning where most of the things I haven't been wearing clothes wise, for instance, I will give away to charity. Um, you don't need, if you're not using it, most likely not going to continue using it. You will not miss it. And so you lead a lighter life. Uh, I wouldn't try to avoid purchasing things in, in the first place to avoid this, but regardless, very healthy to do on a general basis. Uh, now let's talk about like much more specific how to, I mean, doing what I've just described, it's, it makes you more productive already and not consuming any news saves you a lot of time. But how do you like multiply your horsepower in general? And this brings me to point number two. So what's actually helped me the most by far is outsourcing. Um, I outsource everything I can in life and everything that, that I don't love doing. Now, you may think, hey, I can type faster than my assistant. Why would I want an assistant? Well, if you've studied economics at all and Ricardian theory of comparative advantage is even if you are better than your assistant at everything that she does, because you make more doing whatever it is your core activity is, you're better off still having it, still, still having an assistant, even though you may be better than her at her tasks, um, and that's okay. Now, the key superpower we've found and discovered is using remote assistance, especially in the Philippines, um, which we've been working with for like probably around 20 years here at FJ Labs. And well, personally, and then at FJ Labs uh, in the last decade, we have 10 of them uh, at FJ Labs, and I have a personal dedicated virtual assistant. I use YRA, um, but a friend of mine who's a genius at outsourcing, uh, his name is Jonathan Swenson. Swenson. He built Thumbtack. He had like thousands of like people in the Philippines for Thumbtack. Just created a company called Athena, actually to help uh, people be become master delegators as well. So these two companies are great. YRA is about fifteen hundred a month full time, and so this is someone extremely qualified working at your hours, whatever time zone you're in, in English. Um, and Athena, I think, is about three thousand a month. But you can also buy quarter time or a half time. And I'm going to show you that you can outsource a lot more than you think. Um, so in my case, I have a dedicated assistant. Her name is Rose. Uh, probably not her real name, but that's okay. Maybe a team and not one person. That's also okay. And actually, the funny thing is I've actually never spoken to her on the phone. I've actually, I don't know what she looks like. Uh, and um, I've never even interviewed her. The way I recruit people in general, um, well, in the case of YRA, they just find someone for you, and then you decide if you like them or not, and then you and then you decide, and if you're not happy, they'll change. Uh, but when I hire people in Upwork or elsewhere, which I will describe later for the other activities that I outsource, I usually hire like 10 people for the same task, given that it's like a buck an hour or $2 an hour. It's not a big deal. And then I see the one I like best, and then I keep that person for the rest of these tasks, not just this time, but on a recurring uh, basis. And so that process works reasonably well. It saves you a lot of time of having to do interviews and, 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 and filtering. So work outsourcing. Now, a lot of this is probably, probably going to be more basic. But basically, this is an example of the email Rose sends me every day at the end of the day of what she did during the day. So it shows all the pending meetings that she has yet to confirm and schedule. And then number two, all the confirmed meetings uh, that she scheduled. She, in that same email, and she also covers all the personal tasks, et cetera. So it's an email that she sends me daily of all the things she did for me. And during the day, we typically interact by a combination of WhatsApp and email on things to be done, whether they're urgent or, you know, things that can be scheduled for a later day. Every day, uh, and this is a prototypical example of what a day looks like for me, she sends me my calendar for the next day. Now, if I know what it's about, she doesn't put more details, just a Zoom link, you know, so Zimozi is my Indian team that helps me with my blog from a design perspective or coding perspective and with Trident's uh, website. We're doing a monthly check-in to see how things are going. Uh, we're currently launching, that was the 9 a.m. meeting. 
we're currently launching a, um, a new incubation company. And so that's the 10 a.m. meeting. Doesn't need more detail. Uh, quick check in with Martin. He's uh, on a 30 minute call. That's the founder of Mundi. We're checking out how things are going. And then for Midas, so this is a meeting I added myself to the calendar, which is why there's no context. But uh, I was meeting, I think, a potential employee or a potential partner. And then I have a bunch of meetings uh, with, I think, VCs or partners uh, for Midas. And then later on with my co-founding partner at FJ Labs, Jose, to discuss different things. See how the rest of the day goes. You know, so you see it's kind of like back to back to back, 9 to 10, to 11, to 11, 30, to 12, 30, to 1, 15. Uh, VC meeting for Midas, which is the new stablecoin or yield-bearing stablecoin that I'm currently launching to try to compete with USDC, USDT. Another, then I'm meeting a founder, uh, actually at my place, uh, just to catch up. Like she, she left her old company. She's thinking what to do next. And so it's interesting to figure out and see if I can help her and also think through what she should be doing. Is she creating a new company? Should we be investing there, et cetera? And that has full context. Uh, same thing, meeting another VC for Midas, 2 p.m., 3 p.m., meeting another founder to get an update on what they're up to and how they're doing. Um, more fundraising, founder calls, and then going to a speaker event for a speech I was giving the next day at the Transatlantic Leadership Forum. And then I'm playing paddle from 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. with my brother Olivier. So everything is in here, whether I'm doing a meditation, whether I, uh, I'm playing tennis or paddle, everything is in the agenda. And this way I, know I have a clear action plan for the day. And that is sent the night before uh, when Rose signs off at like 6 or 7 p.m. every day. Perhaps the place or the thing that you can outsource way more than you think is actually your personal life. So Rose, in addition to managing my, private, my, my business life, manages my personal life. So here's a few examples. So in New York, I love hosting salons and, and founder dinners and intellectual dinners, et cetera. So I have a list of a whole bunch of people that I invite for different dates. And so she, we will discuss who we're inviting. She'll send the invites and then we'll pre- create a, an email with like, uh, th- this is the venue, send me your d- dietary restrictions. This, these are the topics. Um, and the topics are far ranging. It could be like, oh, how do we reinvent politics for the 21st century? Um, what are the ethics and morality of torture? What, um, or even personal, like, you know, um, if you were to write a, a book on any 72 hour period of your life, what 72 hours would it be? So we track, I mean, she tracks who the, the guest replies are. We try to be eight for these dinners. Uh, but we also do these things with, uh, you know, founder dinners, et cetera, on a regular basis. I host multiple dinners a week. I hosted a post-exit founder dinner last night, for instance, uh, doing another dinner tonight. Next thing is there are a lot of things that take a lot of your time. You know, so for instance, if you want to book doctor's appointments, if you want to fill in all the the, the forms on medical forms, you'd rather do it ahead of time, she can do all that for me. And these things you have to wait online, uh, wait on the call, et cetera. Um, she can pretend to be me. Uh, she has a Google phone number uh, in the Philippines, so she has a U.S. phone number. So, for instance, T-Mobile had disconnected my international data. It took her four hours on the phone with them, repeated calls to fix it, but she was able to fix it. And again, it's four hours of my life that I would have never gotten back, and very grateful that she is actually in a position to do that. Same thing, she books uh, my meditations. She blocks all my gyms and, and, and buys whatever the, the trainer needs to buy. And for tennis, like she knows I like tennis. So if I'm traveling to a new location and there's tennis or paddle, she will look at all the clubs around me, look at availability, find either people at my level or book me lessons. This way you're ready for two, three times a week, wherever I'm going, I already have tennis organized and I don't need to do anything. I didn't pick the club. I didn't call them. I didn't find the partners. Everything's organized in in the calendar. I guess um, I'm not doing it more right now, but... In the past, I even outsourced things like dating, uh, where with my assistant back in the day when I when I, when I was on online dating apps, um, I first like we did a call where like okay, this these are the people I like or don't like, so this is how I would swipe right or, or 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 left. Now use a VPN, connect as me, and you can swipe for me. Then okay, this is how I and and then she would do it, and we would agree on course correct what made sense or not. Then she would look at how I would chat and she would replicate that. And then finally, I'm like, okay, I'm happy to go on a date, you know, once a week, Friday and maybe whatever, Tuesday, twice a week uh, at 8 p.m. or 7 p.m. or 9 p.m. 
here's the slots on the calendar, go and book them. And so she would like then swipe for me, match me with a potential date, schedule the date, it'd be in the calendar. And then the day before I would look at like the profile of the person that she matched me with and I'd decide if I'm interested in going or not, right? Like if you're trying to go in online dating, at the end of the day, the rest is not interesting. The only thing you want to know is, do you like the person you're meeting? So let's get to a meeting as fast as possible. So if you can avoid the entire tedium of swiping, chatting, et cetera, and get directly to the last point, great. And if I disagreed with the choice, you know, I said, no, I don't actually like this person for whatever reason, which of course corrects her, she would just cancel the date and that was it. And so it didn't take any time for me other than showing up at the date, which was always literally in the bar across the street from where I live at whatever the set, the set time was. And so even an activity that seems to take a lot of people a lot of time was de minimis from a time perspective for me because it was all done for me and it worked extremely well. Now, as many of you know, I love writing. I love writing on my blog. Um, I, I blog on a regular basis. I share things about my life. Now, I do the writing myself because I love it. I do the research, I, 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 et cetera. But the rest that is and mini about it, which is actually putting on a WordPress, uh, replicating it on Substack, creating the newsletter, sending the newsletter, all of that um, she, she does for me. And again, saves a, a huge amount of time, right? My The value creation is in the creative genius of writing and what I want to share and thinking, et cetera. Not at all uh, in the in the admin you know, let's go to WordPress and, and, and upload it and send it and et cetera. So I like the writing, not that other part. And she does that for me as well. And by the way, all this is one person doing all of us. Um. She buys things for Angel, my dog. She will also research like entry requirements and I get passports for a dog. She will buy things if I need for, for Fafa. Uh, she, the, there's an app that the school, the call has, which is amazing, where there's all the photos of the day. She will download the photos. Um, she'll like pay the nannies, like everything needs to be done. But like even researching things like, oh, how do I get someone a birth certificate or a passport? You know, she will research, um, which is also a massive uh, time saver. Um, by the way, I'm noticing all the questions that people were asking. I will address them at the end one by one. Uh, so we'll do kind of a Q&A at the end uh, of uh, when I'm done presenting everything here. Um, so she signs documents for me, um, but the documents I would say that are not the most important ones, right? I, if I rented a, a house, you know, rental agreement, or need to do KYC. So things like that that are not really important that I don't need to be doing myself. She has my digital signature. I say, okay, sign this. Poof, or I forward. She has actually also, probably worth mentioning, she has access to my email. Uh, and she has access to my credit card. But she has one credit card. And so what I can do is every month, I can log in in that one credit card and see where the purchases are and make sure everything's okay. So that's the, the safety control mechanism, if you want. Uh, but she has access to my email and she like, all the legal documents are sent to legal, so I don't need to deal with them. All the uh, all things that look like spam are moved in a folder called potential spam. So again, I don't need to deal with them. Uh, but I'm the one replying to my own emails because many of them need my thoughtfulness. But she will, you know, if I need to find how to get a police form uh, for a frame before some whatever reason or KYC someone asks, she will like figure out how to get the data and, and help me get it. So again, online general and mini docs, et cetera. Now, um, continuing on like things that most people don't outsource that they probably should is like figuring out how to have a more rich life in wherever you live. And so for instance, in New York, I love magic. I love Broadway. I love off Broadway. I love comedy clubs. And you don't want, once you've done the basics, like going further off the beaten field, you know, going to a house of yes for a dirty circus show or whatever, or going to company 14 in Bushwick to see the, their, their, their various shows. And so I have her before I go to new, new city task word, like what are the things that are happening right now? So this is an example of, um, oh, and actually might as well, there's a lot of chat here. So might as well add the chats and, and this way the comedian can see uh, the conversation that's going on. So this is an example of uh, when I came in September to New York, she researched all the different musicals that were like Broadway, off-Broadway, that are in a bit off the beaten path, including reviews, suggesting the ones I would like, the nice I could do. And from there, actually ended up uh, 
uh, booking multiple shows. I, I took my son to a balloon museum, which is so much fun. I'll be posting the photos of that on Instagram in a few days. Took my son to a train show at the New York Observatorium. Um, I went to see like an off-Broadway like musical parody of Friends. Um, she ordered my like Halloween costume. They're like, there's so much that you can outsource to make sure that your life is rich as rich as possible. And in New York, I try, there's so much to be done that you can have a very rich life. Uh, again, New York is my haven of like social, artistic, professional endeavors. And um, things like, you know, conferences I need to go to. Same thing. She'll send the bio. She'll show me the agenda. She'll add it to my calendar and make sure that that, that I show up. Uh, next thing is uh, she helped me create the um, my... 50th birthday invites. So I'm celebrating my 50th birthday next uh, August 3rd in 2024. And so help design the, 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 the invite on paperless posts. We're sending it. We're tracking who's coming. We're, we're figuring out like all how many rooms we need, where, et cetera. And so she helped design it. She, she sent it and she's tracking the replies to make sure that everything is, is structured uh, correctly. But even for that, for instance, I also hired a party planner uh, to help me with like the vision of the night and what's going on and everything happening. So I don't need to deal with all the and many things uh, from that perspective. Now, I also have a travel agent uh, for booking flights. But beyond the travel agent, Rose will help me on like everything around how do I get there, uh, uh, hotel rooms, getting upgraded, getting reimbursed. So Burning Man this year was supposed to fly out on Sunday, but of course it was muddy, so it got canceled. So I walked out of Burning Man, like getting reimbursed for the flight that I didn't take, uh, and you know, adding heli skiing to the agenda, notifying people at FJ Labs I'm not working these days. All these things, you know, need to be done. And again, none of them seem particularly big, but they add up. And and the more of these things you outsource, the more free time you have to do what you want. Now you can add, beyond Rose, as I said, I already have a. Uh, a, a travel agent, I have a party planner, uh, but I hire other people for other tasks. So every year, for instance, I like to create, and maybe let's just go to uh, me here. I like to create an album. This is a photo album of the of what happened during the year. Uh, it starts with a timeline with every date, uh, chronological from the beginning of the year to the end. and um, And then for each section, there's photos uh, of, of, of what's going on. And it's a beautiful album. It's a paper. It's a memento to the year. Now, the reason I do that is um, parents don't deal with digital very well. And, and actually creating the album allows you to relive the year. So I love it. It's all over my library. I give it to my mom. I give it to my dad. They, they love it. It's a way to connect with the story I have. And so I went on uh, Upwork. I created a post saying, hey, I need someone to help me with this. And I got a lot of replies. As I said, I hired, I hired like 10 people to do the job. And ultimately, one person in Bangladesh um, was the best for these and, I, and, and, and went well. Originally, someone in Russia, but then I couldn't pay them anymore because of the sanctions. So someone in Bangladesh. So the way we work together is, um, actually, let me take a step back of how I organize my my photos. So let me share my screen again. Um, not necessarily the easiest to see. Let's see if I could go full screen. Okay. So during the year, and this is all the photos I've taken during the year, you see all the dates, you know, January 1 to February 22, February 23 to February 27. For each of the locations I am, I create a folder. And in that folder, um, I have a subcategory of what's going on there, cross-country skiing, February heli skiing, FJ Labs, etc., which can then be used to create subsections in the album. And so I don't do that. And by the way, I do this along the year as the year is coming along. So if you wait until the end of the year, you won't remember anything. <laughs> Creating this structure will be impossible. So I take the photos on my phone. Um, I get photos from my friends uh, through AirDrop or whatever. And then I, I create the folder. So for instance, I already have in 2024... January 1 to January 7, Turks and Caicos, where I was, and now January 7 to January 14 in New York, where I am currently, where I'm uploading photos little by little. And I delete them from my phone once I've uploaded them. So this is all in Dropbox. Then I share the Dropbox link. Uh, let's go back to 2022 because that was the example I gave you. 
uh, with my Charmin, who's currently in Bangladesh. And then we have it, interactions on uh, on it. So she she does a first pass as to what she thinks uh, makes the most sense. And let me go back here. Let me go back to full screen. Okay, perfect. So she does a first pass. And let's go back here. See if this can read. Yeah. And then after she gives me the first pass, <laughs> I give her a lot of feedback. You know, date format looks wrong. Or, oh, I don't like this photo. So for each page, there'll be like photo one, two, three, four, five, six. So like, oh, replace photo one, for replace photo two. Oh, I look fat. I don't like this angle. Uh, this is not that interesting. Oh, you're forgetting something. Um, I don't like the quote, whatever it may be. And so this is, I'm the creative director for for this endeavor. It takes a lot of iteration. I'm currently working, for instance, on the 2023 album, which I hoped will be done in, in a few weeks or a month, which I will then gift to my parents, but also put in my coffee shop, coffee desk. And you saw the, the result of it is after many iterations, the album that I showed you uh, with the timeline, in photos. Again, no one needs to do this. Not everyone needs to do this, but I find that it's an amazing way to relive the year. And it's an amazing way to, uh, to something, an amazing gift to give to your parents who love it or not great with digital and giving them a link on whatever Dropbox. Um, I do the same for videos I create. I'm going to share a video. So at the end of the year, I create a, a video. Um, now I will play an example of that video. So I, I will go, oh, uh, one minute and 15, change this. One minute, 17, do this. The so same thing. I found someone on, out, on, on and, and uh, I found someone on, on Upwork and we added videos. Again, something other than Rose. This is what it looks like. I'll give you a quick example. Uh, let me minimize this. Give you, let me give you a, a quick example of uh, what that looks like. Uh, da, 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 da. uh Let's see, 20 video is pretty cool. Year in review video. Let me make sure there's no sound because it's copyrighted music. I don't want to get a copyright strike. Perfect. So let me play uh, a few seconds of this. Maybe I'll make it even full screen. Uh, and same thing. It follows the the um, it follows the year. So it starts in January. In this case, I was in Rubble Soak. Shows um, there's it, it's set to music. It shows the adventure, and then it goes through uh, the rest of my year. And I play that at the family gatherings at the end of the year. I send it to the family. I send it to friends and family, et cetera. And it's pretty amazing. Um, and you know, you see the first increment, but then it it, it ultimately. Uh, it, it ultimately moves to, you know, I was at the Upfront Summit and then I go and hosted things and then the COVID, et cetera. Okay, pause this video here. And we can go back to the next type of things that I outsource. Yep. Uh, let's go back to this. Up, 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 up. And let's go back to the presentation. Up. Okay, so next phase of things that I source. Now, I realize this next phase is not necessarily possible for everyone. I am extraordinarily privileged from a financial perspective uh, to be in a position to outsource things in the offline world. Now, the online world, I think it's, with, it's within reach for most people. As I said, it's like 1500 a month. Um, and 1500 a month to outsource as much as I've outsourced is, is actually pretty extraordinary. Uh, when you, the bang for your buck that you get is amazing. And I've gotten more out of doing things online with Upwork and your remote assistant, et cetera, than, you know, with in-person assistance from, from that perspective. That said, you know, at FJ Labs, we have an office manager that does a lot of the offline things. But for the things I described, uh, the virtual assistants of the Philippines are actually better. Now, as I said, I'm also in a privileged position to outsource things in my offline life. Now, this is way more expensive and so not um, within reach for everyone. But I have an estate manager. This is Paul. We've been working together now for 80 years. And in addition to being an estate manager, he's a chef. And in fact, I've organized it. That's very often the estate manager is the chef. And he does anything. So he manages all the other property managers. I have three properties. I'll go through that shortly. Um, he drives me if need be. He organizes like the housekeeping staff. If I'm hosting a dinner, 
if it's small dinner, he'll just cook and take care of it himself. But he will hire um, waiters. If we're catering, he'll hire the cater. Like anything, like getting um, car insurance, car maintenance, picking up packages, dealing with the mail, anything that's like in person. Now, in my case, I don't actually like cooking. So for me, I want to outsource it. And I tell him to have, I, he knows my, I don't also plan my meals. I don't tell him, oh, this is what I want to eat. It's like, these are the things I like. Just go if, go for it. Be creative. Uh, feed me healthy food that that I'm going to like. Um, he doesn't run the menus by me. Just does it. And I trust him to do things I like. And if I don't like it, you know, I'm just actually going to, to give him feedback. Now, I have this kind of setup for each of my three locations. I have three core locations where I spend my time. Um, and for each of them, I have a property manager who also is a chef and manages the rest of the staff, handles the licenses because I, I sublet them on, on Airbnb if I can, which I can't in New York or Rolf Soak, but I can in Turks and Caicos. And their goal is to delight me and or whatever guests I have, be they my family or renters from the Airbnb equivalent. Um, now, the reason I have three homes is I've made a decision to structure my life in a pretty non-traditional way. Um, two realizations. Realization number one is each city has a very best moment or time to live in. So New York is extraordinary in the, in the spring and in the fall, right? Like you want to be in New York in uh, September, in October, in, in April, in, in May, in um, uh, and, and maybe the first half of June. Uh, it is way less compelling in the summer. It's too hot. It's too humid. It's way less compelling in like January, February, December. And so I try to go to the places where there's where it's the best time to be there. So my year is typically structured with January, February in uh, Revelstoke Soak in British Columbia, where I like to go backcountry skiing and weekends and, and and snowshoeing and ice climbing and and dock sledding, et cetera. But it's mostly a brand backcountry skiing, heli skiing. March, uh, I go to Turks and Caicos to thaw and like kite surf and play tennis and play paddle, et cetera. Uh, as I said, April, May, June in, in the New York area. And then I start heading to Nice to see my family in the south of France uh, before usually going for my birthday in, in uh, Turks and Caicos. And then all of August, I go to Rebel Soak in the mountain, where I like to go mountain biking and hiking and rock climbing, etc. Then I go to Burning Man. Then again, September, October, New York, and then November, December, Turks. Uh, though, to be exact, I usually go to Turks until December 26th. And then New Year's, uh, I spend in, in Rebel Soak. That's why I have snow for, for New Year's and in the holiday season, in addition to having the sun. Now, in addition to that, every year, I'd like to add a two-week trip somewhere where that is new and, and, and a massive adventure like Antarctica in 2023 um, that is often off-grid and adventurous, you know, where I'm like just a backpack and a tent and a water filtration system. The Beyond that, um, so that that's core setup. Um, and beyond the fact that each place has a best time or location to be there, um, my perspective is that each, um, you want your work-life balance. And so New York, as I mentioned earlier, is a place of professional, social, artistic, intellectual activity. Uh, it is busy 24 seven. I'm, I'm going out, I'm meeting friends, I'm, I'm hosting dinners, I'm going to events with founders. It is so busy that after a month or two, I am completely burnt out um, and I'm tired and I need a place to recharge. Now in Rebel Soak and Turks, I'm not on vacation. I actually work during the day. So Rebel Soak typically, I will uh, only do the backcountry skiing, et cetera, in, 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 um, on the weekends and or if there's a day off. Like this month, we have two days off in January. So I'm taking the – and I think there's a Friday and a Monday, and I'm heli skiing those days in addition to the weekends. Um, and same thing in Turks. I'll work during the day, but when the day ends, whatever time that may be, I'll go kite surf and play tennis and play paddle and read and write and meditate. And so the – you know, New York, I'm doing – and in Rebel Soak and Tricks and Caicos, I'm being healthy, I'm being reflective. And it's a combination of a place where I'll either be alone um, to recharge my social batteries or, I'll, or I will bring a huge gathering or smattering of friends and family. So, for instance, uh, uh, this year, and I'll, I'll go back to uh, for a quick second if it'll open to my blog, I brought 50 people. I brought 50 people for Christmas 
uh, and New Year's, uh, which was like the gathering of my family. And this is this is our New Year photo. Fifty people of both the family I have and the family I choose, uh, which has been absolutely amazing. Like going back here, so it's kind of like the life setup in terms of like moving around. So continuing of the things I outsource, uh, I also outsource the. So I've separated for for Triton, for instance, which is rented out when I'm not there and generates millions of revenues a year, the guest services, local in person versus reservations. So I have a reservation manager, um, so Rayanne, who helps like create the pricing, uh, manage the different channels, uh, the and, and, and do all the reservation part of the experience until it is handed over to Lori and her team uh, to to do the actual guest services experience. Uh, she also usually or sometimes has someone from YRA to help uh, with the work that she needs to do. As you know, I got a dog this year, Angel. And uh, for Angel, um, for at least for the first few years, given how busy I am otherwise, especially in New York, I have a full-time dog walker, dog trainer, um, travels with me everywhere, takes care of Angel, gets the vaccines up to date, Get, gets all the papers uh, and everything that needs to be done. And that's Mike. Um, and uh, it, it helps, especially when you live in a place, you know, like New York. And when I'm busy in New York, uh, you know, obviously when I'm in Turks and Rebel Soak, you know, Angel can be roaming free and we can be playing, play, play all day. Like, But even then, I want her to be very well trained. I want to be able to walk with her off leash uh, and her not to, and just follow the directions. If I want her to play, she goes play. And if I want her to come back and pay attention off leash, regardless of distractions, squirrels, other dogs, cars, whatever, that she listens. And so I want her to be very well trained. And Mike is amazing for that. So nannies, um, actually, before I talk nannies, maybe I'll go back to the, 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 the travel setup for a second. Now that I have a, a son who's starting to go to school, uh, instead of doing two month, two month, two month, I don't want to be away from him too long. I'm actually making sure that, A, obviously, we spend all of our vacations together. And when we're in New York, we're together all the time. But when I go to, like, Turks, let's say, December 1 to 15, it's like two weeks. I'll still spend a week in New York um, to make sure that I'm around him at the right time. So I'm changing the, even though it's a bit more travel, I'm changing the two month, two months to more, like, two weeks, three weeks, one week, two weeks, et cetera, to make sure I spend more time with him. So nanny setup. Um, so we wanted coverage uh, seven days a week from 7.45 a.m. to 7.45 p.m. So we found um, uh, a bunch of uh, nannies on, uh, on, on care.com mostly, some Facebook groups as well. The core mission or the core vision was that one of the, the, the nannies to be in fluent accentless French uh, who can travel internationally, so I have a passport, and can drive. Uh, which obviously creates a number of limitations. The and and the reason for the French, by the way, is obviously I'm French. My family mostly is French speaking. We live in New York, so he's going to be getting English in general, even though he's in a bilingual school called the Ecole, which is absolutely amazing. It's like the rigor of the French system with uh, creativity and public speaking and teamwork of the American system. Um, because school, TV, friends, whatever, and living in the U.S. Um, uh, is in English, I figured let's have the nannies only speak French to him. Um, now, what I have the nannies do is uh, when we travel, it's only one nanny that travels with us. Uh, and But if it's multiple weeks long, maybe they'll, t- they'll, they'll, they'll swap. There's a WhatsApp group for the nannies to coordinate between each other. So the reason it's for them, by the way, and you can meet them here, you can see their little bios and who's doing how many days, etc., is... Um, they, well, French nannies, I guess, want to, don't want to work too many hours in general. And so this is kind of the amount of hours they wanted to work. So someone would work once a day a week, two days a week. And so actually having four part-time uh, who agree between themselves, who's traveling, who's taking what days, et cetera, uh, works really well to give us full coverage with, without any issues. They're paid on a per hour basis or an hourly basis based on the hours worked. So there's a WhatsApp group. They coordinate, they, they, they train, uh, they tell each other what happened before, what needs to happen. And they have a calendar called Cozy where all the doctor's appointments, et cetera, that they populate and they know what tasks need to be done. And they do everything from cr- preparing one meal a day to buying di- uh, gro- gro- groceries. Well, diapers not really needed anymore, but 
medicine, bath supplies. I mean, whatever needs to be taken taken care of, they they do in addition to taking care of Francois, picking him up at school, dropping off at school, et cetera. Now, in addition to that, let's say there's a date night or I need to go out or whatever, and I need coverage beyond 7.45 p.m., add the slot requests and the calendar, and they between themselves agree who's going to take it. So again, it, it doesn't require me to do anything. Now, I realize this is a pretty expensive proposition because I have uh, essentially seven-day coverage, uh, 12 hours a day. There is a cheaper way for people to do this, uh, which is uh, if you have an au pair. Now, an au pair, the issue is, A, they need to live with you, so you need to have room for them, which is not viable for everyone. And typically, it's only one or two years, and the number of hours they work is capped. So what you can do for it to be a cheaper alternative than this is au pair plus daycare. If you do au pair plus daycare, you can get something not quite as bespoke, but rather effective um, for a fraction of the cost of what I'm describing here. Now I have a nanny handbook, which shows all the rules. You know, you need to speak uh, to the to him only in French. Uh, when I, my daughter's coming, you'll only speak to her in French. Uh, when you need to cook, when you need to cook, what's the, what, what, what Francois likes, uh, uh, et cetera. So everything is kind of like explained in the 90 handbook. This is only two pages of it, but it's actually like whatever, 20 page handbook that's prepared for any new nanny to be onboarded automatically and be able to be effective. Um, so that's basically it in terms of uh, what I outsource, how it's outsourced, et cetera, which is way more in general than you think you can. Uh, so let me go cover some of the questions that were asked uh, and taken from there. Okay. If not, you'd like agendas for the startups you're interested in investing in. So the time is managed properly, question from Payom. So I don't need an agenda for the startup I'm investing, I'm I'm going, I'm considering investing in. As long as I have the deck ahead of time and I've read the, I'm, and I've reviewed it. So I won the deck for sure, because I want to make sure that I'm ready and I've, I've prepared. So when I typically take second calls, which is what I usually do, um, I have read the first debrief. And so I'm not going to have the founders re-repeat the full story over again, over and over again. I mean, as a founder, when I was raising money, it, it drove me crazy that VCs regularly would be just making me repeat the same story over and over again. I'm like, do you not guys not read each other's notes? Do you not want to go deeper into it? It feels it felt shallow every time. And so I will read the debrief by the first debrief of whomever wrote it in the team, uh, took the first call on the team. Every I will, I will read the deck. And I'm going to go straight into q and I don't need re- the entire story repeated to me, which I think is also a courtesy of the founder, but it also leads to a more deeper, meaningful interaction. Um, so no agenda other than that. Let's see. Um, what else? How do you quantify time saved? How to be sure scheduling actions do not consume as much time as you would like, as you would have not outsourced the task at all, I mean, for low-value tasks. Um I don't quantify it. <laughs> I, I can feel it and how much time I have to do the things I love. You know, so for instance, uh, it's not all that hard to buy things on Amazon, but if I have like 20 things to buy, it's way easier to like, you know, send Rose, oh, buy this, 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 the link, and like she deals with that. It's not a huge amount of time, but like little by little it adds up. So I'm not quantifying it in general. I just realized that in a given year, I can do so much and so much more than most people because I, I am fully levered up. Um, the other, you know, and I guess superpower user of AppSource people, as I said, is Jonathan Swenson from Thumbtack, or formerly Thumbtack, now creating Athena. I think we're going to do a uh, joint session. We're going to like see our best practices and see if we can learn anything from each other to to figure out what, if anything else, we should be doing and what, or, whether or not we should. It's worth quantifying. At the end of the day, I'm not doing this to be more productive, as I said, which is why I'm not trying to quantify it. I'm doing this because I want to lead an amazing, fulfilled life. And so for me, the proof is in the pudding. If I'm actually spending my time with my son and playing video games and reading books and doing things I love doing rather than things I don't like doing, it means it's working. And so that's kind of the way I think about it. Not reading news. What are your favorite analyst source of insights? Um, so I love... No opinion, uh, Noah Smith. Let me uh, share that here. He's on Substack. Let's see, Noah. Uh, opinion. Of course, I have my microphone in front of me. So, oof, oof. Thanks. So, of course, 
we share a lot of like similar, oh, wait, I need to share my screen. Uh, e, we share a lot of like similar um, philosophical alignment in terms of like techno optimism and, and we're both economists by formation. So I, re, I read no opinion. Uh, I think it's really interesting. And the other things I'm members of, uh, or I don't know if they're a, uh, actually, let's see, uh, ergo, maybe it's a consultancy. Okay, maybe doing this live is not the best, we shall see, yeah. So this group, uh, and they they have the, like a lot of thoughtful analysis of what's going on uh, and everything from politics, geopolitics, macroeconomics, et cetera. Actually talking about it for a, a quick second, um, when it comes to politics, I don't really follow it because if I, if I take a step back, I don't think it matters all that much. Uh, and actually, I would argue politics have been, in a way, the political system in the U.S., which seems so broken and like the making of the sausage is, is awful, actually kind of works. You know, if I go to the 1950s and I'm like, and I'm a Democrat and I'm like, oh, what do I want to see in 70 years? You know, so in 2023. Uh, I want desegregation. I want women in the workforce. I, um, I, I, I want general. I want like IVF and the pill and and a lot of like these social socially liberal trends that have actually happened. And yes, it, it ebbs and flows, and there's setbacks in the Roe v. Wade, etc. But for the general part, it actually, if that's what you wanted, you've gotten it right. Um, and we're seeing right now like uh, drug legalization, uh, et cetera, or at least decriminalization. And if you're a Republican and you're like, well, I want D and you're in the 1950s and I want ah, lower marginal tax rates and less regulation of industries like airlines, et cetera. The reality is you, you kind of got that as well. Um, and so over the long period of time, the system works, but the day to day is acrimonious and awful. And it's not that relevant. It doesn't change my life in any way, shape, or form. So following politics is literally, it's like negative entertainment. It's like a form of religion. People follow it and they feel so passionately about things that I think ultimately in the grand scheme of things don't matter all that much, right? As a kid, my ambition was to be in politics uh, because I looked at like the people that impacted the world in the past, like uh, Augustus or Octavian or Alexander Hamilton. But in the world we live in, Politics really doesn't change all that things too much. Uh, and I don't think it's a bug. I think it's a feature. I think the founding fathers created a system that was balanced where it made things hard to change out of uh, by, by design. And, and so it takes a long time to get there. Um, but I think ultimately you get to the right outcomes with like, yeah, populists here and there and, and, and things that ebb and flow. But it gets there. I mean, Churchill once famously said that, the U.S. can be counted on doing the right thing after all other options have been, <laughs> have been tested. Uh, and I think that tr tends to be very true, uh, but ultimately does get there after many, many mistakes and, and meanderings. And so I'm profoundly optimistic, actually, on uh, on the fact that we will get ultimately the right outcomes, even though the day-to-day -day can feel weird and scary, et cetera. But by the way, is it that much more acrimonious in the past? I mean, you need to remember the U.S. had a full-blown civil war. Um we we had political opponents that used to shoot at each other in duels. I mean, I'm very um, you know sad like that Alexander Hamilton died in a duel back in the day. Uh, we had like massive uh, civil 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 rights riots, uh, race riots. We had an anti war movement with riots. If anything, it's less violent today than it was 30, 40 years ago, and so it feels worse. But I think it may very well be recency bias, and so yeah. Don't follow politics, waste of time. <laughs> Don't follow news. Uh, focus on things you can control in your life that make you happy and focus on positive things. Because if you take a step back, most things are amazing and like getting better every day. And and when I look at the life we led like when I was a kid and today, so many things have gotten better and cheaper. So I'm profoundly grateful and optimistic to grateful to be living now and optimistic about the future. Um. So Thomas is asking if I worry about potential fraud, given that she has access to my information, emails, et cetera. The reason I don't worry um, very much is, first of all, she doesn't have access to, she has a credit card to pay 
but that's it. She right. She doesn't have my. She can't send wires. She doesn't have access to my banking information. And in credit card, you're not with a credit card. You are not liable for credit card fraud. And so all I need to do is every month go through the credit card receipts, make sure I approve of all the credit card purchases. And if not, I dispute them and then see where they came from, um, which has happened multiple times, but not actually from my assistant, from people like, you know, somehow getting a credit card number and trying to buy things with that. Um, but actually, the, the credit card company is reasonably good at detecting weird patterns or behavior and blocking transactions. And it, regardless, they reimburse you when fraud happens. So hasn't been an issue. Um the so yeah it doesn't have really have access to anything other than that credit card which is c- kind of itself a, cre- a control mechanism and in terms of emails you know most things in that are really secure that you, you use a, a ledger or, or a yubikey or a two uh two-factor authentication right like email doesn't really give you access to these things so all of my really secure things uh are fine and and if i think of the cost benefit analysis the risk of fraud versus the time I'm saving, it's completely worth it. And also, I don't give her access to email directly. I think there's a way to delegate so she can reply on my behalf and see emails or whatever. I'm not the one who set it up. It's uh, my good friend, William. I don't know exactly how it is, but it works pretty well. Um, I'm thinking another question that was sent ahead of the episode by Saeed Jabbar. How do you learn how to break into flow states as well? Um, Perhaps a, I think I'll do another episode on, on flow states, but obviously part of the objective of these things is to be present and, and, and to be in a position to get into flow states. And, and so for me, it's a combination of meditating and I have a meditation practice. Um, it's 20 minutes a day, sometimes 30 minutes that I do every day that I will share in probably an upcoming episode of like, what is my meditation practice? And maybe I'll broaden it to flow states because flow states you can get through mastery, right? Like, I would argue possibly in a flow state right now presenting this. I could be in a flow state playing tennis or kite surfing. So if you're really good at something and you like it, you can enter a flow state through the mastery of that. You can get through flow states through meditation. You can get in flow states through psychedelics, which I like uh, partake in several times a year. Uh, not not often, but like, you know, with set intention setting, you know, like LSD or psilocybin um, or, or it could be an amazing way to do that. Um, so I will do another episode, I think, on flow states, meditation practice, um, and cover that there. But perhaps the way it relates to this episode is this episode is how do you free up time to do other things? And one of those things you can do is actually get into flow state. Uh, let's see what other questions we have. Um, okay, Sharaf from up. Dharma Portco. Well, hi, Sharaf. I'm glad to be an investor. It's so transparent and super helpful. Do you ever get professional imposter syndrome choosing to live with such radical transparency and, and need and with what makes you personally happy? Um, I've never had imposter syndrome. So maybe this is like takes us to a different topic on like happiness in, in general. I... Many people I talk to, they have this like little voice in their in their in on their, or in their shoulder, which is like, "Oh, you're not good enough. You're not this enough. You're not smart enough. You're you don't belong here." Um, if anything, as a kid, I, I was really Sheldon Cooper, uh, and in, at co- in college for sure, I was Sheldon Cooper. I had the opposite problems. Like I I belong. I thought I belonged there, even when I zero. And so for me, it was more like, "Oh, obviously, I'm amazing. I'm extraordinary. Everything's am-. and." and so I never had imposter syndrome um, from that perspective. I, I felt I belonged. Now, the difference is as a kid, it was delusional. I thought I knew everything. And then, of course, as you get older, you realize how little you know. And once you fall flat on your feet, you re- uh, on your face and <laughs> you get your teeth kicked in, you realize that how little you know and, and you approach life with way more humility. I was a definitely arrogant uh, uh, before and, and now I've come to realize how little I know, but I know some things, and that's what I'm trying to share here. Now, the beauty, uh, or not the beauty, is like, I'm actually not famous, right? Like, it doesn't, sharing all these things is my way of giving back to founders and people out there who want to live a better life. Um, but I'm, the, and it connects to those it connects with, and it's a very small subset of people. I don't have a publicist. I'm not trying to be famous. 
I'm not trying to be a public person. I like sharing what I learn and it helps the people it hurts. But I am not going, I don't want to be, I don't want to have the public profile of Elon. I could argue I have more impact on the world than Elon in terms of like changing the lives of people today, right? Like uh, uh, I, I'm an investor in 1,100 companies. They're highly deflationary. They touch the lives of billions. You know, how many people have gone in space with SpaceX so far? Yes, it makes you dream, but it's not changing the lives of people on a day-to-day -day basis, you know? Millions of people make a living off the, of OLX, the company I built. And, and to me, that's real impact. Both are useful in their own way. But regardless of impact, would I want to be a public persona? And the answer is no. I have exactly the level of visibility I want to have where marketplace founders come to me for advice and come to me for investment. And I can raise funds to do whatever I need. But I don't want more. More than that would probably be an impediment on my quality of life. Um, I can lead the life I lead with no restrictions. I don't need bodyguards. No one bothers me. No one recognizes me. Being anonymous is amazing. Um, so I share out of love for writing, speaking, sharing, learning. It's also a way, like kind of the, part of the reason I write publicly is it's a way to think through and uh, for myself and to learn what I've learned. It, it structures my thoughts. So as I think through what things I want to do in the future, I usually write them down. I weigh the, the pros and cons, and, and publishing them leads to conversations, which I think are interesting. But because I'm not popular, I'm not famous, and I have no intention of being famous, um, this works, and it's okay to be transparent. Now, it'd be possibly different if I, if, you know, if 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 I was walking down the street, people would bob me, or I go to restaurants or whatever. It'd be it'd be an inconvenience and lower my quality of life. Then I wouldn't do it. Uh, but as is, where it's just sharing life lessons, it, it, it works, uh, and it, it has not impacted me um, at all. And by the way, I like doing this. Like, I get pleasure out of, like, sharing, speaking, thinking, uh, and I'm very good at it. Like, as I said, it's possibly one of the ways in which I'm out of flow state. Love writing, love speaking, and it comes very naturally to me. You know, none of this is scripted. Like, if you look at the speech I gave at the uh, Transatlantic Forum on the State of Entrepreneurship, it's a 15-minute speech with no pauses, no hums, no highs, no execute. And I just gave it, uh, and it, the speaking of it came to me naturally. Now, of course, practice makes perfect. I practiced it many times. I had to learn the quote by Mark Twain, but uh, ultimately worked. Okay, next question. Um, so Sam uh, on YouTube, uh, what's the craziest thing you've outsourced? Uh, I mentioned earlier, it's a, I outsource my dating life where... I, I I I train my assistant to swipe for me on like Bumble and and uh, and Raya. Um, I showed her, okay, these are the people I like. Okay, now for one hour, then or thirty minutes, then okay, you do it. Okay, I, I agree, I disagree. So we iterate to get the point of ninety five percent. Then I'm like, okay, we match. This is how I would chat with this person. Uh, now you do it. And then okay, I agree. This is how I would speak. Okay, now here's my schedule for the next few weeks, uh, set up a date these days, these days, these days, and she would go ahead and schedule dates with people. And the only thing I needed to do was show up on the date with, obviously, uh, I would have a printout beforehand of like who the person is, what we talked about. Um, and if I didn't like the person because she chose incorrectly, A, we'll refine the process on a go forward basis, but B, uh, I would just say cancel the date. And so it took no time for me. And the date would always be at the bar, literally across the street, actually from where I live here, like literally across the street behind me. So it takes very, very little time. Uh, Thomas, one more question regarding the virtual assistants. How well does it work with their support in countries with other languages? Um, so the Filipino assistants don't speak French. Uh, so she uses Google Translate. Uh, so if you're in France or French, I would use a different company. I don't know what company to recommend. I'm sure one exists. Maybe they can find someone who's French speaking. I didn't ask them. Most of my interactions are in English. Uh, and for the things that are in French, I do get emails in French. I think she uses Google Translate and it's good enough. So, uh, but I'm, the model I'm sure works and I'm sure there are people probably in, I don't know if it's Algeria or Morocco or uh, Tunisia that do these types of things uh, for French speaking uh, people. Regarding outsourcing, what are the two companies that you mentioned? Let me uh, reshare my screen for a quick second. Uh, up. Go back to the presentation. Tuck, tuck, tuck. And maybe I'll full screen it while we're at it so you can look at it. But the two companies, I. There they are. 
the two companies I actually I'll full screen it for a second. Poof. Uh, YRA, it's it's literally it's your remote assistant.com. Um, so I'll put it maybe here. Up, 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 voila. They have several hundred of them. Uh, we have 10 of them directly. Let me go back to the presentation. Whoops, wrong, uh, wrong window. Uh, up, up. And the other one is Athena, which I mentioned is the Jonathan uh, Swanson uh, company from Thumbtack, who's a master ad sourcer. They're more expensive, possibly a higher end. I have not tried them, but I trust Athena Virtual. Assistant, let's try that. Poof. Uh, and voila. Uh, these are the two. Uh, I have not used Athena, but I, as I said, I trust Jonathan to do this to me, to, to be amazing at this and to make sure that it works very well. Okay, going back to um, the questions. Um, okay. Uh, da, 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 da. What are the two companies? Thank you for this transmission. Super clear. Thank you. Okay. Um, I think I kind of covered everything in terms of why to do it, what to do with the time you've had, what you can ask for us, uh, what and how not to follow news, et cetera. And so um, I'll take you from there. Thank you for joining this show. I think I'll do another show on flow states, my meditation practice, because it's rather productive. It's not the point is not to be productive, but it doesn't take that much time. Uh, and works rather well for me and at some point in the future. And um, yeah, we'll take it from there. So thank you all for watching. And uh, I will be uh, posting this, including the presentation on my blog, probably next week. So you can uh, re-watch it and have access to the direct PowerPoint. And I'm available as usual for questions by email. Thank you. Ever thank you all of you.